What's up, friends? Alex Felice here for Content Matters, here with my always fabulous Sean McGuire. What up, Sean? What up, Alex? Great to see you. Yeah, we had a little bit of a rough week. I uh, live out here in Maui, and as the world has found out, we had a tragedy, a giant tragedy of uh, the Lahaina fires. And so I've been busy. I've been volunteering. I have the Internet's gone pretty lousy here, so it took us a little while to reconnect, but it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh... First thing off the bat, let's talk about the fires. What can people do if they want to get involved? Um, I think you've probably said it before too, you know, right now is the best time where if you do have a following, you can share that message, you can post it. Um, your, your fans or followers, you know, might see the post and make an impact by, uh, you know, contributing to the cost if you don't actually have money. But what are some of the organizations and the links we could drop in the description for people who may have the means to support? Yeah, so lots changing. In the first few days, it was like shelter, clothes, uh, really bad. Now we're starting to get Wi-Fi down there. We're starting to get power down there. People have enough um, clothing and shelter. Uh, food's sort of, you know, we kind of salt. We have enough food for everybody. I mean, to be honest, they're still picking out. They're still identifying bodies. So I think the death count might go up to nearly 1,000 when, when this is all said and done. So it's, it's going to take a little while. But the immediate needs of the people have been you know, more or less met. Now people are looking for, you know, infrastructure, generators, and, and things like this, which is much harder for, like, people on, on the mainland to help with. The real problem that Lahaina is going to have going forward is not immediate survival needs. It's that the news cycle is going to move on, and Lahaina is going to take six to ten years to rebuild. And these are a lot of familial homes that are hundreds of years old that have, that have, you know, long been paid off, but are generally, a lot of them have been underinsured. Some of them have no insurance. And so what a lot of uh, people are going to do is they're going to start funds. And so that's what um, Brandon is doing, and that's what I'm helping him do, which is start a foundation called the Makai Foundation, uh, M-A-K-A-I dot org. You can go there and donate. But, yeah, I mean, people really want to help, and I'm grateful for that, but the reality is um, you can help in two ways. You can send money, or you can wait until the rebuild effort starts, and you can come over here and help build houses. But that's going to probably take... Dude, that's going to take a year for them to just clear out all the rubble. It's going to take a year, year and a half for them to just get undo, undo the destruction before they can even start thinking about rebuilding. So it's a big problem. I was over there the other day. It's a big problem. But the best way to help right now, if you're listening to this, is one, donate to the, uh, makai.org, M-A-K-A-I.org. And if you have a platform, we saw this week out here in Maui, the people with platforms, like and how they use them for good or how they just use them for themselves. And it's been a, it's been an eye-opening experience. So I want to always use this platform for good. I don't really care. I'm the coolest guy I know. I I don't need I don't need anybody else's validation. So um really looking to use use content to help other people. And I think we can I think this week was an opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Okay, guys, you heard it first makai.org. And if you can't donate money, you can always share on your platforms because there's reach within sharing. Um, True that. So my next thing, happy belated birthday. Thank you. Uh, you're Turned looking 40. good. You're looking good, man. Bro, Jim, no kids. <laughs> Those two certainly help. So you, you posted a really cool, insightful video on your Instagram. I watched it. I loved it. It was lessons of life that I've learned so far at this point. And Couple, yeah. one of the things that you talked about was the negative self-talk. And I think that's super relatable. Um, I've dealt with it myself where, you know, I might talk negative. Or even if I don't talk negative, I'll log on uh, Instagram and then I'll feel like a loser because I'll see what everyone else is doing that's so cool. What, uh, what did you do to work on that negative self-talk to turn the switch and, you know, be nice to yourself? Somebody else actually, I, I just made a commitment. I'm like, just no more self negative self-talk, at least out loud. And so when you start telling people, saying things out loud, telling your peer group and your social, your social group, really, when you tell them what you want out of life, it, it sort of helps you hold yourself accountable. So you say, hey, look, I have a problem with negative self-talk and I don't want to do it anymore. So if you hear me doing it, tighten me up. And that works, bro, because then, well, now you at least have to think it. Well, you know, I'm not much of a, I'm a verbal processor, so I don't really think a lot of things that I don't say. Um, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, 
so I just kind of made a commitment not to do it. I told everybody in my social group, and they held me accountable, and 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 that that helped a lot. Um, certainly not perfect. Um, I think part of what going forward, uh, you know, two lessons that I learned is um, one, it's probably good. I don't, I don't want to tell anybody to go to therapy. I'm not going to go to therapy, but a coach, you know, a coach, um, more than just like a mentor you learn from, but like somebody you meet with regularly that that will cheerlead for you. Um, I think that helps. Somebody around your life that's like, dude, you're great. You're not great at everything. You're great at this thing. Do this thing that you're great at. And as long as you stay in your lane, um, stay in where you're good at, I think it's it's hard to be negative because you're going to excel at what you're good at. Like, I'm not going to be negative. I'm not going to negative self-talk myself for not being a great tennis player. I don't care. Never played tennis. I don't care. Of course I'm terrible. Don't care. But, like, when you when you get into things you want to be good at and you're, and you're not as good as you want, then, you know, that's sort of, it, it becomes harder. But I think having a cheerleader around is, is very healthy. Uh, also, you know, you got to understand like tortured artist is a, is a, it's a stereotype for a reason, right? It's a, you're not the only one. This is a, this is a gift of, this is a, the, the, the curse of the, of the artist is, you know, you're like, why am I, I want to be better always. Uh, and the other one is I read this, I saw this on the internet. I forget who, but somebody was like, Hey, I used to have this negative self-talk problem. And, um, Somebody said, uh, treat your negative self-talk as if somebody else walked up and talked to you that way. And if somebody else had, somebody else were to walk up and talk to me the way I talked to myself and say, hey, dude, you're a piece of shit. You know, you suck. That was, that was terrible. Yeah, and you should feel bad about it. Like, yeah, I just wouldn't allow it. I would absolutely, it would be unacceptable. And so I think thinking about it in that framework, like, hey, you're talking to yourself in a way that you would let no one else on this earth talk to you without a like a real aggressive slap in the face like I will fuck you up if you talk to me in some of the ways that I talk to myself so I think like having that framework um has sort of helped but yeah the big one is dude just commitment like I just don't do it anymore and I I know that's maybe too rudimentary but it's like I just recognize that it was a problem I'm like this is helping nobody so it's like it's like eating out or not going to the gym you just just don't do it you know go to the gym just do what you have to do what you're supposed to do um, I'm not saying it's easy, but you just got to make these commitments to yourself. Sure. No, I love that. Accountability, make the commitment, tell your friends. Say it out loud. It's one of Say my it core, it's one of my core, like, I don't know, values, but definitely something I live by. Say it out loud. It's the uh, same thing we talked about before about gratitude. It's like, yeah, you can think you're grateful and you can maybe, but it doesn't. It doesn't count until you say it out loud. Tell somebody, I am grateful for. You know what? This week, um, we had a really hard time getting together, and Sean, you stuck with it. And you know what? Like, you could have easily just been like, this Alex guy is unreliable. I'm going to bail. And I am grateful for you and for that because I really want to do this podcast. I really want to do this show. I want to do it every single week. And, you know, logistically, it's difficult because I live three hours behind you normally. Today, we're five hours. The internet's spotty on the island. da 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 and you stuck with me, so I'm very grateful for that. I well, appreciate it. Well, I'm grateful for you too, man. I know it's been a rough week. Yeah. And I know you wanted to do this, so I just wanted to be the squeaky wheel and keep saying, hey, man, I'm ready when you are. You are the squeaky wheel. You got good work ethic, my friend. You got good work ethic. So, um, you know, you're going to find your you're gonna find your way because a lot of artists, they're, um, they're, you look at the internet and you might see somebody you think is better than you, but they can only do it once, right? You're going to be there. Hey, you can do 90% as good as them, and that's, that's, a, that's a torture you're going to have to live with, but you're going to get to do it every day. I'm not the best artist. I make mistakes all the time that infuriate me, right? But I'm the one here in Maui working, for, working with Brandon, trying to build this podcast, because um, I show up, and I show up enthusiastically. So um, all those things, the reason I said all that was, you know, say it out loud. You, you say your goals, you say your commitments, you say your gratitude, you say these things out loud. You say you tell people your problems, your vulnerabilities. Say it out loud. So powerful. I love that. Okay, jumping into the next question. When I talk to creators, it seems like there's a theme of three things that they all deal with. It's A, how do I get clients? B, how do I package my services? Or C, how do I refine my system for how I do things? And for those who don't know, Alex has a mobile podcast set up with Brandon Turner where they're going to different locations. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about process and what your process is when you go in a room, how you view it, how you know how you're you know, going to compose the shots. Um, 
especially if it's not like a studio that you're renting where it might be like a little bit more of a boring set. What are, what are well, some hang on. tips? Those are two different questions you asked. Like, okay. how do I price products? I'm terrible at it. I don't know. I'm bad at it. I always underprice. I'm terrible. Sure. Um, how do, what was the first question you asked? How do we find oh. clients? Um, oh yeah, packaging your services is finding finding clients, packaging your services, and then process and systems. So I'm bad at all three of these things, and I'm not going to have a good answer for you. But I'll tell you how I solve them in my specific, my unique way. Finding clients, um, I network like a I just network like a monster. Mm-hmm. You know what? Like, what field do you want to be in? You want to be an entrepreneur? It's like, go to all the entrepreneur conferences and have a camera in your hand. You'll get clients because everybody wants video, right? Uh, Do content every day so people know what you do. I mean, like getting work is a combination of people knowing who you are and people knowing what you do. They're not, they don't want to go to Google. They want to go to the the guy they already know. So you just have to be the guy they already know. So I'm not that sure that's a great answer. That's not like, you know, Alex Hermosi doing that big event about leads. I don't know how to get leads. I know how to get, or I, I, I only, I don't know how to get scalable leads. I don't know how to do paid ads. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Um, as for packaging my work, um, I'm bad at it. Usually I'll say like, hey, my rate, my day rate's two grand. You know, my day rate's two grand, something like that. It, it'll go up for there. But the problem I have, uh, the problem that you have with asking a guy like me is um, that was never my goal was to start a video agency business. My goal was to partner with an entrepreneur so I can do my creative magic um, for one person. I'm not a great I'm an investor. So my entrepreneurial side comes from analytics. I know how to buy underpriced properties and create wealth. I don't know how to run a business. So I have no systems. Um, I'm not great at finding leads. I, I'm an artist. I want to work with one person so that he has the business. He's like, this is what we need to make. Done. I just have to do my art. Um, I am getting better. I will forever get better. But I'm the wrong guy to ask for that, probably. The guy you need is Ridge. Ridgeline Media. He sells like coaching and courses on how to get video agencies up to, I think, 20, 30, 40 grand a month. Um, and it's all that stuff. He's an, he's an artist. He's got great content, but I think he's a, uh, he knows how to do the business of production. I don't know how to do the business of production. I am a freelance guy who basically took one client. But I work, I don't want to say I work as a freelancer, but I kind of work as a freelancer. Like I don't show up nine to five. I work when I want. No, that's not true. I work in a, like, chaotically. It's in spurts, right? We get our creativity at different parts of the day, and then we just run with it. Yeah, I am trying to develop a whole system so that I don't have to run, you know, let's take the podcast. Now the podcast is up and running. I don't want to manage it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to manage it. I don't want a system. Somebody else, I'm going to hire somebody to do a system. Just you're in charge of the podcast. You handle the podcast. I'll go do the next thing, and, you know... The next thing's always interesting. And when the next thing gets up and running, I'll go run that. So I don't have a good answer for you, but there's a guy I know, Ridgeline Media. Um, I would like to add him to our little Content Matters community. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll look him up. I've been looking at uh, potentially hiring a coach myself just because I feel like I, it would be helpful to talk to somebody who contextually has been there, done that, and I'm realizing there's a lot I don't know, and it would be nice just to have like a Jiminy Cricket in the corner mentor, somebody who's invested in my uh, success. But what, what about uh, any tips for um, just being a travel videographer, podcast setups in different locations each time? Because like, I know that has to be really hard. You have to have good, at least habits or systems with how you pack things. And then maybe you could talk about how you look at the rooms. Because from the ones that I've seen, like I, I'm always just like, Alex, well done. I like how this looks. Dude, I appreciate it. I don't always get what I want. So I will say uh, I love production. So production, mobile productions on set, I'm the only guy. It's, um, it is a, it reminds me a lot of like the military where you go on deployment. You're like, okay, I'm going to take my bag. I'm going to take my weapon. I'm going to go to Afghanistan and we're going to go to war for, for a little while. Uh, mobile video production is – the stakes are much lower. But the feeling is actually quite similar. Like, hey, you got to pack this stuff up in three, in six bags. You got to go down to, um, you know, Nashville. You got to find a set that I've never found before, and and um, and build a, uh, you know, build a set out of it that looks great. So it's hit or miss. Uh, we got an episode coming out next week with Forrest Griffin. Great interview. Not a great set. It's at the UFC Performance Institute in Las Vegas. It's a conference room. 
There's nothing. It's it's brown walls. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, so you have constraint of location. Also, I make it harder on myself. Every time I go to a city, I rent one set on uh, Gigster. Gigster.com. Love this website. It lets you rent studio and production spaces by the hour. So we go in there, we rent one for basically one different one per day. So every time I'm in a set, if I do a four day, uh, a four day shoot, I do four different sets. Makes my life harder, makes the sets more interesting. Um, it also makes, you know, what I get a lot more variable. I don't know what things are going to look like till I actually get on the ground, how much space we have. The other pro, so you have, you have constraint of of location. Second, you have a constraint of time. Nobody wants to walk in and watch me set up for two hours. So how fast can you do this? You got to figure out really fast how you can do it. Third is, you know, what's your actual equipment setup looking to look like? And I'm, I'm growing in this area. I'm not perfect, but you know, there's basically, um, um, like straight on what's called like, you know, butterfly lighting like this, or maybe even for like, if you had a uh, I, I just we just had this woman on named Nicole Arbor, and I kind of did her a disservice. We used a shadow lighting, and because I'm in the sea shed, and I don't have many options, but we should have just blasted her with light. Because what I learned, and I've sort of known this, but you know, maybe a rookie mistake, maybe an advanced mistake. I don't know. With women, you really don't want to show that much shadow, right? Because shadow shows our character, but it sh we show our character by our flaws. With women, you really want to blast them with light so they look even. And I, I shot her in shadow, and I, I, I kind of, I, I apologize to Nicole, but. With Brandon, you know, we want to show a shadow. With maybe like a Jocko Willink, you want to show him in the shadow side, right? You want to show him really, really rugged. And so these are the sort of things when you walk on a set, you're like, okay, who are we shooting, right? And how are we going to set the lighting up so that we can, we can get them that correct way quickly? Um, and then also I'm limited by what I can bring. I have one big think tank bag that cost me $550. I have a $100 Godox bag for tripods that broke. So I have to buy another big tripod bag, and uh, that's not going to go well with the team. Did TSA uh, chuck it, or what happened? How did no, break? just, just get, it just there. got beat up. Okay. It just got three tripods and four light stands. It just got beat up. It's just not structured that well. So it, it just, stuff's rattling around in there, and it got beat up. It's a little five-foot bag. So there's definitely challenges with doing mobile. You have to like that type of production. Um, I carry on five, uh, three big man photo tripods and three C70s. Um, by the end of the year, we are going to have um, Tim Ballard on the show. Now, he's going to come to Maui, but still, that's, we're going to shoot that with a five-camera setup, which means i got to buy two more C70s and two more uh, tripods, which means my production, mo my, my mobile production is going to become that much more complicated. So, cameras, more problems. Mo cameras, more problems, yeah. So I will say, if you are looking to do a mobile production, um, you know, you probably don't need to do what I do. I probably, I, I made a mistake. What you need to do is you need to go off and get smaller cameras, smaller tripods. Um, but that's only a small percentage of your problem. You're still going to have the big lights. You're still going to have um, to check a lot of bags. Get the media passes. I used media rates for all the airlines. Wonderful tip. I'll tell you that one another day. I'll show you my media badge. But um, it's a lot of work. You got to like that. You got to like production. You got to like the stakes. You got to be able to work fast. And then you have to live, learn how to live with your imperfections because every set is going to be different. You're going to like some better than others. And you also run the risk then of, you know, when you get online, you see Brandon's face or you see somebody's podcast, you don't always know that it's Brandon's show because we're always in a different location. So you lose that consistency, which I do think is valuable. Uh, it's a meaningful trade-off that we are obviously willing to make, but something to know. You know, there's something about seeing Joe Rogan is always in Joe Rogan's set. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, well, good tips. I like that. Uh, the gigster.com was new for me, so I'm definitely going to check gigster that out. Gigster and PeerSpace. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of PeerSpace. PeerSpace is great. Yeah. I try to use Gigster almost exclusively if I can. Okay. Do you think it's better than PeerSpace? I think in a lot of these instances, it's kind of like Canon or Sony. I mean, Canon's, okay. Canon's better. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not as nearly as important as getting their best one. It's, important, it's most important that you pick. Just pick one. Sure. So I use Gigster because then, you know, the reviews, I get a profile, it all starts to add up. Sure. Cool. No, I love it. All right, so my next thing I want to talk about, too, I don't know if you follow Think Media, but they made an announcement on their channel. Hey, guys, we're not uploading for 10 days. We're yeah. doing a little, you know, vacation. We got a guest appearance on the show. Oh, whoa, who's there? Oh! The barista. 
Hi. Look at this. Look at this latte art right here. Look at that. Dude, that's the best latte. You did a I good job did. today. That's the best latte art I ever did. Oh, you gotta oh, see that. Oh, wow. Look at that latte art right there. That looks unbelievable. Mm. You did a good job. Yesterday I was very displeased. Right, well, well done. Well done. <laughs> I'll do better next time. Yeah, yeah. Hey, dude. Well done. Much appreciate you. You're great. Um, what's interesting about that is uh, Brandon and Sean Cannell, the CEO of Think Media, are in a small group uh, mastermind together. Oh, so I'm trying, to get, I'm trying to get my in with Sean. Yeah, they did a 10-day detox. That's what you're asking me about, right? Yeah, Laporte and Cemental break, taking, taking a detox, letting your team have a break. Because some people are kind of, you know, grind, grind, grind. You know, you look at, like, Jake Paul back in the day. It was every day, bro. Or him and his brother, you know, they're just beasts with content. And then you see somebody like Sean with, you know, a, a company where uh, they really value the employees, the mental health. They take a break. Um, you know, it's like deliberate work when we're working. Uh, but, you know, some people might be fearful of, you know, taking a break. What's going to do the algorithm? I don't want to stop. Um, what are, your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting conversation. I, part of me says, I, I, there's a few different things I think. So one, no human being should be a complete slave to the algorithm, right? If, if you're a slave to the algorithm, then you're literally giving up your humanity because we don't work on algorithms, not really. So I agree with that. Um, do I agree about stopping to... Um, you know, to the the health and mental health needs of your company? Absolutely. Um, does it make for good PR? Yes. I think that's the most biggest benefit, actually, is that it it's a, it's a really good PR sort of, look, you're talking about it. We're talking about it. You think it's good. Um, now, the downsides. One, obviously, yeah, maybe you lose a little momentum. I don't think so. Sean, Sean and Think Media are big enough that I don't think it makes a dent in their, in their process. So I think they have the luxury of being able to take that time off, which is, which is good. Um, for a smaller creator, I think, you know, if you're somebody who's like your first year on YouTube and you're posting it, you know, once a week and then you're like, I'm going to take two weeks off. I'm like, does it benefit you? No. Do, do you need it for mental health? Maybe. So obviously your mental health is more important. Um, Especially, but also depending on like what your, you know, what your financial situation is. Maybe you're, you're in a position, there's a lot of times in, in life where you don't have the luxury of taking 10 days off, no matter, no matter what your mental health is. Um, but to me, yeah, I, I do. There's a suspicious side of me. There's a suspicious, there's always a suspicious side of me. This is not about think media. This is just, I'm born with suspicious eyes as my fiance calls them. Um, is it, what's his company? Is this company not big enough that they can't have st st staggered breaks? That they can't post and have people take time off? Is a is company... Brandon takes 10 days off all the time. Right? Takes vacation. You wouldn't know. His social media continues to run. Um, and, and the people that run the social media take time off. So, uh, you know, they, they schedule things. And it's like, hey, we're going to schedule everything for the next 10 days. Which they could easily do. And just let it run. I don't, I don't understand um, why they don't have that infrastructure in place. So... I also wonder if maybe something happened that we don't know about. Is it, it, it definitely seemed like a, to me, it seemed like a PR move, which is perfectly fine. It's not a criticism of Sean or the team or Think Media at all. It's just, I look at that and go like, why? Why? Who wins of you not posting 10 days, right? It's not a, it can't be an infrastructure thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's what I think. I think a bunch of different things. Yeah, no, good, very well said. I like the idea of having staggered teams, you know, where it's like this: these guys can take a break, these guys take the realms, yeah, and then flip flop or schedule, like you said. Um, yeah, I wonder if something in the team happened where they're like, maybe they are actually burnt out. Yeah, or maybe and it's like guy, a team retreat or something where they all just went. I don't know. I just saw the video where they said they're not posting yeah, for ten days. Yeah, even then, I'm like ten days. I don't know how many videos they put out. They put out a video a day. I'm like, you couldn't front load 10 videos and just release them? I mean, I don't care. I don't consume that much think media. Media. Um, it was just, to me, it's just, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, like, position to say, like, hey, we're not posting for 10 days. And I'm like, but posting doesn't always mean that you're there posting. You can schedule it. So what are you actually saying when you say we're not going to do anything for 10 days? Are you trying to advocate 
are you being an advocate for taking time off for mental health? Um, in that way, I would say, I would say in that, in that case, it kind of missed the mark because the point, I don't think the, the, the goal is for people not to work for 10 days. Rather, I don't think that's a good goal to teach people. I think maybe making your, your life, your job more efficient so you can take, you say, hey, there's a way you can, there's a way you can take 10 days off and still be putting out content. That would have been a more, I think, better message. So I wonder, my suspicious eyes goes like, I don't know what happened in the back end there. But to me, I'm apprehensive that it's just completely altruistic, that everything's going fine. And they just said, hey, we're gonna take 10 days off. Just, you know, whatever. I wonder if something big happened, maybe as a team, like you had a little revolt, like, hey, we're working too much. We, we're gonna take, we're gonna, this is unsustainable. Okay, 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 okay. And they maybe overcorrected and said, let's take 10 days off flat, which is fine. The stakes here are very low. Um, the stakes here are very low. I, I think, um, uh, and the last piece I'll say is you have to be hyper, 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 hyper competitive. In a perfect world, Sean, I would do this with you every single day. Content matters every single day. We do a, uh, we do a live show and we would do it every day because we are in an attention economy. Taking 10 days off from the economy does not make your, uh, it might make your mental health better, but it doesn't make your career better. Flat, like full stop. Does not make your career better by taking 10 days off. So I, I do wonder what the impetus, like what the, the motive, I, I wonder what the motive was and what the cause was. Sure. Yeah, no, good point. And a I'm lot just of good talking points there. Yeah, I'm just spitballing. I, Sean yeah. seems like a tremendous guy. This is not a criticism of anything they've uh, done. It just makes me, I'm curious. Yeah, no, I'm curious too, because I, I was surprised to see it. And uh, I think from one angle, it's it's nice, you know, or it, to work with a leader like that who could acknowledge the importance of it. Because I think, you know, uh, we've all probably worked or been in circumstances where you don't get to have the balanced life. And like, I know for me, I perform better when I get to still fill up the other buckets of my life with the working out, reading, learning, working. And when I'm all just work, you know, all gas, no breaks, it's led to burnout. And then it kind of, you know, starts the cycle of, you know, maybe mental health or you don't sleep well or you start to gain weight or. The, the creative entrepreneur, the creatorpreneur is a very unique case. And we're in a really unique spot because the algorithm wants you to like die for the algorithm, right? But the creator is bursts. The creator is, uh, we need space to think and to get inspiration and to get bored and be like, I'm sick of being bored. I want to go make something. And the algorithm does not like these things. And in fact, even consumers don't really like these things, right? It only sort of works for the creator. Um, I don't want to consume excellent content sporadically. I want to consume it every moment of the day. So it, it's an interesting it's an interesting position because he is a, he is a creator, but also uh, a CEO. And so... You know, it's, it's interesting to watch different personalities approach the creatorpreneur space because you see guys like Ryan Pineda, who is, um, not, again, not a criticism, just a, just an analysis of his personality. Um, oh, did you lose me? I can hear you. Yeah. But you froze. Yep. You'll never guess, but. Oh, man. This is going to become a ritual of the show. Yeah, it's not a show if, if your camera doesn't die at one point. It's not a show if my camera doesn't die. All right, what we're gonna do, bro, we're gonna get like, we're gonna get like fans. And then they're gonna talk shit about this. It'll be like a- It'll be a bit. It'll be comments. People will be like, get a Sony, the battery won't die. <laughs> <laughs> when I get an office, I'll just hook it up to a dummy battery. But for the now, I'm always, I'm always mobile, so it's just hard. Um, yeah. So I look at, um, so go back. We were talking about um, how different personalities work with the creator space and the algorithm. Yeah. Um, guys like Pineda, like that guy's a machine, right? He's yeah. a creator in some very specific ways, but he's not like a tortured artist type. Um, so he can work nine to five and he can make content every week, week in, week out, no problem. Like, that's my nightmare. I want to, every time I have to make something over and over again, it's kind of like the podcast. I go, I shoot, I love it. I come home. I don't want to deal with it anymore. I've already done the editing. Like, I don't want to, I've already done this content. Somebody else edit it and just upload it. It's just tedious stuff. It's not creative. So, um, so yeah, watching Sean do like, 
you know, just the way they, they interact with the algorithm differently. And, and like you said, getting time off and stuff like this and, and, and just all the ways that the creators and the algorithms work together. It's just interesting to see how people approach it differently. And there's no right or wrong. I mean, Sean's, you know, he's had wild success and I'm happy for him. And so he's got the luxury of being able to say to his team, hey, we're just going to take time off. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, back to, to being my suspicions, I wonder if it's good advice for, you know, younger creators who are just starting out because that's not always... That's not always, you know, 150 years ago, you had to work on the farm every single day to survive. There was no 10 days off. I don't care how burnt out you were. You had to live. So we live in a very luxurious culture where we can afford to do those sort of things. Um, but I don't always know that's what's best for human beings. Sure. No, well said. I, I had another friend say that to me the other day. They were saying, we're just in a soft society. You know, it was so much harder 100 years ago and now... Now we're worried about our feelings getting hurt or our pronouns or being offended. And like, kind of like you said, back in the day, it was like you had to show up to work every day. You got to, you know, go on the farm or the assembly line and do your job. And there wasn't even a choice to pursue passions. It was like, oh, my dad taught me this trade. I'm going to do it. And that's it. That's how I'm going to feed my family. And yeah. Well, you, there wasn't enough food or money. You had to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm showing my age because now I, the older I get, the more I'm like, yeah, I, the society was not better 150 years ago. I will never say that. It's not better. It's better today, but it does make for soft human beings. And I, you know, I'm grateful for the U.S. Army. They made me, bro, I'm one of the toughest dudes walking around mentally and physically. I'm just tough as nails and emotionally. Like I have my, my moments, but like when the stakes get high, I get calm. And I'm grateful for that because I do not think it is... Uh, I have the thickest... I have rhinoceros skin. Okay, you cannot get through my... Uh, you, you just can't hurt my feelings with words. And um, I, I think it's a superpower in today's society because just so few people have it. They're, they're worried about, you know, their mental health from burnout working as a barista. I'm like, I'm just not... Or it's like, again, it's Sean. I mean, you know, video creator. Oh, we get burnout. I'm like, you're living like a king. Yeah. No offense to Sean. No criticism. Yeah. Just using him as a good example. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Um, so there's young Alex out there. He's got a little bit of a creative itch. He's got a camera. His goal is to become a creative director. What are some things that he could do to work towards that? You know, what are some skills he needs to develop? Because I think, like, when I first heard the word creative director, I was like, what is a creative? director like are you just like the master of everything adobe um what do you do as a creative director titles are a farce my friend okay. titles are bullshit sure. titles are bullshit i'm what you know what i am i'm a producer mm -hmm. I, I i produce a podcast right now um creative director i i think young alex what i'd say is um if you you, you don't want to be a poor, starving artist forever. So use, uh, and the other thing is you don't want your camera to become a tool that, like, you want to keep it a hobby as long as possible. So go do something else to make money. That's what I would say. If, especially if you don't have kids. If you don't have kids, you have time for two hobbies. One should make you money. One should be your creative hobby. They sh maybe they overlap. Maybe they don't. Um, if they overlap and you enjoy it, it's great. But if you give up your... If you give up the ability to make money because you want to be an artist and then you don't make and then and then you're an artist, a starving artist, it's like who wins? Who wins? You're gonna sit at, at night, you're gonna do some tricky after effects edit for somebody that doesn't care for you, and it's 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 a fun hobby, but it's not a li it's not a lifestyle. And that doesn't matter until you have a, a wife and kids, wife or kids, or you wanna realize that the ultimate goal in life is to take on as much responsibility as possible, which means bearing more burden than you create. You should take on more responsibility than you produce for other people. A starving artist is very difficult to do that. Now, and most of us are not like, you know, uh, like actual hyper artists where you can just make millions because, you know, I'm not Peter McKinnon or like an Ansel Adams or, you know, some like very, very successful, you know, unique artist. Um, and maybe your art is something that doesn't even make money. You know, maybe you're not a photographer. Maybe you're, maybe you're a painter. It's like, dude, you're really going to struggle. You got to learn how to make money. And I know that's not always fun for the artists to hear. And 
but I also know that most artists don't try. So I got a buddy in Virginia. He's like an Emmy award winning videographer, cinematographer. He's great. Broke all the time. And will not spend any time. He, he'll, he will sit around lounging, waiting for gigs to come to him rather than learn how to make money. And you don't have to be an entrepreneur to make money. You can be an investor. I'm an investor. I'm not great at building businesses. I'm not great at systems, but I know how to buy cheap assets. I know how to analyze deals. Um, and there's a lot of art, uh, people out there that you can learn how to make money with and you can use your skills to help them. So, so instead of trying to build a photography business, if you're not a good entrepreneur, it's like, go just do what I did, which is like, hey, this guy's making money. Maybe I can just, you know, pour my cup into his river get some, use my skills to add to him. And even, you know, Brandon's going to be a billionaire. I'm not going to be a billionaire. I'm not going to get half skis. I'm going to get some small fraction, teensy little bit of that. But it'll be more than a good living. And there'll be deals along the way that I can get a piece of. And I get to do my thing. And so find somebody. So learn how to make money. Learn, how, learn the language of money. That's the whole reason this podcast exists is because I know both languages. That's the whole reason this podcast exists. That's the whole reason why I've had all my success because I speak both languages. Most artists, they only speak one language. And like you said, you know, you get, you get in your head, you're like, oh, I'm not the greatest artist. It's like, go be 80% at two things and you'll be the best at the overlap, right? That's where I'm, I'm the best at the overlap. There, people look at my podcast like, yeah, lit, it's lit wrong. It's this, it's this, it's this, mistakes, yada, yada, yada. Right, and they look at my business, my real estate business, and I'm like, dude, you don't know, you're not the best real estate investor. I'm probably the best real estate investor slash photographer that exists. Right, I'm probably the best. I might, I, I I'm gonna declare it now. I am the best. I'm the best video camera guy with a couple of million dollars in real estate. I'm the, I'm, I'm the best at both. I'm the best at that overlap. So go learn a second language. Go learn the language of money. You don't have to be, you have to find your way. You don't have to be a great business owner, but you have to find your way. Sure. You can be an, you can be an investor. That's what I would tell myself. And that's, the, that's probably not what you want to hear. You probably wanted to hear, I think, here's how you start a video business. Like, you don't go start a video business. That's the way to, that's a, I got a buddy in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, great photographer. He is so stuck on his bills are so dependent on him going out to work every day in the business, right? That he can't escape to go do passion projects or spend time hiring people and building it out and building a system. So he just gets stuck gig to gig to gig to gig to gig. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's tough. And then, then you get kind of uh, in that cycle. You might get in your head. You can't take a break like we just talked about. Yeah, well, you live and die by the next gig. It's like, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. you eat what you kill. You're Don't. Just, uh... That's what most video camera people do is they get into this you know, gig to gig life. It's, it's, it's almost no different than working a nine to five, you know what I mean? Like, um, rat race yeah. just week to week. It's like, you do not, that is the, that is the bane of everybody's existence. You don't want that. Learn the language of money. And when you say learn the language of money, do you mean find a way to make money with the skills you have or get a job or just being smart with your money and saving it, investing it? It's so funny, yeah. Um, uh, you should learn the financial markets. You should learn how stocks work. You should learn how, what, like over the over the last ten years, the Federal Reserve, right? Do you know that I most of the books I read, probably half the books I read are um, macroeconomics, and the other half of books I read are philosophy. Um, but understanding what the Federal Reserve is doing will let you become a much better investor. So if you learn the language of money, like what is, how does inflation work? How do in interest rates and inflation go hand in hand? Um, how, does, how does compound interest work? If you understand, what did Einstein say? If you understand compound interest, you can make all the money you've ever need, needed. Um, Einstein said the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. Yep, I was just going to say that. Right, it's, it's a powerful phrase. Compound interest is how, dude, Dude, I'm going to end up, I'll end up probably in my life with probably maybe 50 million when I retire, maybe a maybe 30, right? And it's not because um, I'm out here making millions. It's because I have assets that will just end up 
worth thirty million. Right? He's gonna wait. So you gotta you gotta buy stuff. Do you understand how um, amortization of loans works, right? Um, if you understand how leverage and debt works, cash on cash return, how return on investments work, how to read a profit and loss, how to read a balance sheet, understand what underpriced and overpriced assets look like, uh, how to what dollar cost averaging is for the stock market. Like every week, I buy. Uh, the S&P 500. Every week. When it's up, I buy it. When it's down, I buy it. Right? Understand how much psychology goes into making money. Do you realize, you know, Warren Buffett famously said, um, the stock market is the only store in the world that when everything goes on sale, people leave. When the stock market drops, people sell. They get, they leave. Right? They stop buying. When people, when, and you have to understand that this is an emotional thing. And as artists, right? For art, my artist friends, my entrepreneur, uh, creator friends, this is the hardest for you because most people are very emotional. That's where the art comes from. I'm an analytic, thankfully, um, which makes me a worse artist, but it makes me sort of, um, it makes me good at, this is why I'm able to do, be able to be good at both. And this is why I stick to production. I'm not a great storyteller. I'm okay. Um, learn the language of money. Learn the time value of money, what that formula looks like. Understand compound interest. Um, just, you know, spend time saving. Buy some stocks. Um, read some re, re, like for every uh, for every five hours of YouTube that you watch on how to you know your frame rates how to do this thing in Adobe how to you know edit audio like all the new AI like all this tinkering that we do like screwing around in, in, in Adobe like just making this you know transition that's really cool and nobody cares but us but it's like dude spend one fifth one fourth of that time learning money and you'll be rich. And then you can go do whatever the fuck you want with creative. Then you can money, l- money lets the creative, it's like, I, you know, you don't need that much money in this world to have what's called fuck you money. Right? If I, if I said to you, hey, Sean, like, I'm going to give you $60,000 a year passive income. Dude, your life would change. Because then you're like, okay, well, that, I can live on 60 grand. Now I can go create whatever I want. And when you have the freedom to create what you want, the likelihood that you can come out to Maui and work for Brandon Turner is higher because I'm like, okay, if not you, then somebody else, I don't care. And when you're, and when somebody, when you're not desperate, when you're not selling from desperation, then people chase you. And then the whole dynamic changes, just changes your life. So learn the language of money. That was a very long answer. I'm so sorry. I love it. All right. Cause we're on the topic of money. How would you tell somebody like what percentage breakdown should they do with their money of what they should be saving, putting into education, maybe buying new gear? What would be the, the breakdown? Well, I'm the, okay, uh, read The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon will make you rich. Save, save 20% of your income no matter what. Okay. And then what you do is if you're a spender, right, give it all your credit cards. Pay all your credit cards off. If you're a spender, if you're an impulse spender, put it into an ally account. Right, which has no credit card, put it into a savings account. That's three days digital transfer. It will cr- kill all your impulse pur- purchases. As for gear, um, if you're having a gear problem where you're like, I need gear to do this this gig that I don't have, you need to charge more. You probably need to charge more. And you say, Hey, look, I got to buy this microphone. I got to buy this light. I got to buy this thing for this gig. It's gonna be a thousand dollars. You're gonna pay for it. And that's just that's another part of business. We just have to learn how to ask. I'm not saying I'm the best at it, but you gotta learn. You gotta, uh, as we say out here, Maui's up your ask. You got to learn to up your ask. So try to buy as little gear as possible. Gear is usually not the problem. Gear makes your life a little bit easier, but when you're new, like suffer. There's a lot of guys that are doing really, really interesting things with cell phones, bro. Oh, for sure. For sure. Right? It's, it's not a gear thing. I mean, we love the gear. I love gear. I'm, I'm always buying gear. I'm not saying, but if you're new and you're trying to put your money together, you always got to think the person who I care most about in this world is future Alex. Future Alex always gets paid first. My mortgages get paid second. The gear comes fourth, fifth down the line. Future Alex always gets paid, non-negotiable. And that's 20%. And some of that money goes to savings and some of that money goes to investing. Um, and over time, when that money, you know, when that money accumulates, I end up going, I go buy real estate. So when the thing hits 100 grand in the bank, it's like, I don't want to sit on 100 grand and let it die to inflation. I go buy a house or an apartment building. Um... Well, I said, I love it. Yeah. Those, so, are, those are the questions I got right now. Dude, you, I, you are great. I come on, I, I come on my own podcast. 
and I get interviewed. This is great. This is great. Well, I love I love picking your brain. This is fun. Yeah, this is fun. Um, hey, you did a great job with those shorts too. You cut up. I got a lot of. Oh, I got a lot of people reach out to me. They're like, I got. In fact, I got to meet with a guy. Oh shit! I think I got to meet him to, this morning. I'm like locked out of my Google. Somebody oh, reached no. out to me and said, "Let's hang out. Let's do a, a show together or something." Dude, nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, if if you, because uh, I like doing the um, those podcast intros. I like you guys. I like your energy. If you guys need help with. Um, yeah, the podcast intro you did, I still haven't given you feedback on Forrest. Um, let's talk about that one. I think that one missed the mark a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but they're hard to do. But I'm going to send you some examples. Uh, that's, a hard, that's a hard task, but I definitely want to stay. I definitely want to find more ways for us to work together. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I mean, that was because when, when I was doing those, like it's, I love listening to the interviews. It's fun. And then I, once I kind of started looking at those as like, a, it's like creating a trailer of the conversation, I was like... Ooh, that, like that like hit the switch for me where I was like, this is fun. And then when, after we had the talk and you're like, give them the dessert first, which seems so counterintuitive to like kind of other, other ways I've done things. I'm like, oh, I love it. Okay, now I just get to pick the good parts and put it in there. Because like I saw when he guys posted the, um, the first one we did where when Brandon's like, oh, should we keep this in there? I don't know. And then it cut out. I saw a couple comments where people were like, oh, good cliffhanger. And I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like, that, that felt kind of good just to see. So if, if there's a way, uh, if there's a will, if there's a way, I was like, put me in, coach. Because, yeah, I know I, I might have missed the mark on the, the Forrest Griffin one. But I'm open to, you know, revising as you like. But it, it also sounds like that might have, that ship probably sailed if you're already posting his video next. No, it's coming out Monday. Um... No, I really want one, but I, uh, I've been busy, so it's my fault. Um, yeah. Let's talk. We, I actually have some time either today or tomorrow. Um, let me, let's, let's riff on it a little bit. I don't know how much time you have because it'd be, it'd be kind of a crunch now, but I would love to, to do it if we can. Sure. Um, but, I'm happy to talk about it whenever, whenever it's convenient. I know this week's been like freaking busy up the waz, man. So. Yeah, it's been crazy. So, but um, hey, let's, uh, let's wrap this guy up. Okay. We need, a, um, we need an ending bit. Oh, like like uh, if you enjoyed this podcast and watched till the end. No, more like something funny. Like every episode, like hey, um, like uh, uh, we should talk about we should do the Canon versus Sony like conversation every week. Yeah, I actually, yeah. I actually was building out. Uh, I'm trying to build out this website for Content Matters, and I want to be able to give away free like equipment lists. Like hey, if you're starting oh. a studio, here's what you buy. And I did the Sony list and I did the Canon list. And when I got done with it, I I tinkered with it for hours, and I was like, there's no way that I can justify somebody starting a studio with a canon <laughs> yeah yeah well there, there's studios here in vegas where they have uh they do the live stream setup style with just mobile phones and they edit podcasts i mean it really comes back down to you. the best camera to use is the one that ha- you have on you so yeah but if you were going to start i could not justify yeah. i'm looking at it, i'm oh, like sure Canon, they're more expensive. They, they the 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 the, cam- the Sony cameras have gotten around the thirty minute recording limit, which is amazing. They're cheaper. They're just as you know. We shoot if you're shooting content, you really need ten eighty at thirty frames. Sometimes you need four K. Rarely, they all do four K anyways. And the lenses, the lenses. Canon is gonna they they're gonna take a really hard hit switching to the RF system because Sigma. You can't get Sigma lenses, and they don't have all the good RF lenses out there right now. So if you want to get a Canon and you want to get a cheap Sigma art lens for an RF can- camera, it doesn't exist. So it doesn't exist. So like you're in this weird spot where like you can get adapters and this and that, but then it's like it makes a Sony more and more appealing to get the same quality. Um, and they don't wow. make, they don't currently make a Canon like a 1.4 um, f-stop 24 millimeter or anything like that. So they don't have all the lenses out yet. So it's like they really are in a weird spot. Now, as a artist, right, if you're a high-end artist, like somebody who's got the resources to buy gear, like I do, like, dude, this is an R5 with a 24 to 70 Canon. This is as good as it gets. Like, I'm good. But if I was like, hey, you're going to start a podcast, I'm like, you don't need that, right? You need a ZF-E10 Canon for uh, Sony for 800 bucks and a Sigma lens. And, like, dude, you're, like, world class for cheap. Yeah. You cannot do that with a Canon. So it's been really interesting. So, okay. I think every episode at like, we got to go a little bit faster. This is 49 minutes. We got to keep this down to 30 minutes. Yeah. But I think sure. every episode at, 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 at minute 25, we'll do the Sony versus Canon talk. That'll be fun. Sure. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I dig it. Yeah, no, you give good answers. They are a little, you get chatty, but I, I, I can just keep listening. So I like listening. Yeah, uh, I appreciate but, that, but also it's not good yeah, for me. Yeah, no, you're right. Well, Danny Fleshman at the last event I filmed that he spoke at when they did their market research, because he launched his podcast, it's like Money Mondays, and they went like up to number one right away. He seems to have it figured out. But he was saying that most people work out for like 45 minutes and people listen to podcasts during their workouts. So that's why they made all their podcasts 45 minutes. And then he probably does batch films and has like a whole marketing team. But I thought yeah. that was interesting, just the 45 minute mark. I think for, uh, but they do it every, they do it Mondays. I, yeah, I think um, it's, it's workouts, it's at home, it's cars. Um, the average commute is 25 minutes. I think the problem is if you see the average podcast time is 45 minutes, but that means a lot of them are two, three hours. Sure, yeah. No. I will. So that actually, I think the ideal recording time is 30 minutes. And I'm not yeah. saying that because, look, I talk too long. I can't talk for 30 minutes. I, I talk way too, too much. But I think I'd rather do two shows a week. Sure, yeah. We could, we could split these in half, and then I could put, like, a little timer. and uh, Or I'll, I'll start messaging in a chat if we, get, uh, if we get too long on one answer. Yeah. So I well, had, it's... I, had, I had a couple other questions too. I was going to roll through, but I, I cut it off early because I was like, "All right, we've, we've, uh, we hit the time mark we, you know, over the time mark." Yeah. Let's do another one. Let's do another one. Well, we'll talk about it off soon. But let's let's wrap this one up. Let's try to keep them to thirty minutes. Um, hey, I know we have a couple of uh, viewers now. Really appreciate everybody. If you like this video, it's only going on YouTube right now. It's not actually on a podcast format yet. Uh, but uh, leave us a comment so we know you're out there. It's it's um, it's something like some very tiny minuscule fraction of users actually comment and so the creators don't know so i know we got some uh, viewers so yeah if this is useful if this is fun if this is interesting leave us a comment let us know really appreciate it sean you're the best dude i appreciate you oh i appreciate you and i appreciate everyone who watched